The Gospel is from Matthew, the 16th chapter. This particular passage is a climactic point in Jesus' ministry. God reveals to Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds with the promise of a church that will overcome the very gates of Hades. And this passage contains one of my favorite questions. It is a question, the ultimate question that is infinite for us. Our answer is not as important as the fact that Jesus asked the very question. So today, once again, we hear as we do every year, Jesus asks, but who do you say that I am? The Holy Gospel from Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Beloved in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ, the one who asks us today, but who do you say that I am? What's the most important question that you've ever answered? What kind of commitment did it call you to make? Was it a lifetime promise? Many of us remember the day of our confirmation, that day when we went up before the entire congregation, a little nervous, I suspect, and made a promise to fulfill out the gift of our baptism and to live in that promise. Or perhaps you might remember a wedding day. That day you were asked that very important question. You may have been so nervous you didn't even know quite what to say. So do you? I, I, I do, do you? I, yeah, I, I do. I do. I do. Yeah. Or perhaps you've joined the U.S. military. An all-important question, an oath, a promise that you made in that to protect and to serve. Or perhaps you've had that moment where you brought your child up to the font. And, and you were there, and you were asked that important question, do you promise to fulfill these obligations? And, and well, here you are, yes. For me, besides the gift of family, marriage, and baptismal promises for them, I, for me, uh, just a week or so ago, on August 14th, the anniversary of my ordination, an important day of answering questions. So today, we come to this question. Jesus says, but who do you say that I am. Now for us Lutherans, we know that context is everything, right? So right away from the beginning, we have a little instruction in this passage about context. Jesus was asking this question in the district and the region around the city of Caesarea Philippi. What's that? Well, that was a prominent city in the northern part that was named after Roman authority that reminded the people of God in Christ the Jews, that uh, also that, that Caesarea Philippi, that they were an occupied place, that that political system was an imposter serving as the political system, and they suffered around it. I think it was no mistake that Jesus asked these questions so near to that city. Well, who do people say that the Son of Man is? People, what do you, what do you think? 
And so in that political reality, which was no reality, they began to give answers about the only reality. Well, some would say that um, you were John the Baptist, which would have been a compliment, I suppose, because he was a very important religious figure. But remember, he was executed by the false political system of the wicked King Herod. Others say, Jesus, that you are Elijah returned, and Elijah, a very important prophet of God who also struggled in life. And still others say of you, uh, Lord, that you are Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Jeremiah is one of my favorite because of the wild way that he brought words of prophecy, and he too died in a challenging way. All good answers. And do you suppose, do you suppose they knew it was coming? I mean, what a surprise. He turns it around from, hey, what are people saying around about? What do they think about me? To the pinpoint question, but you, you, who do you say that I am? And as you might have expected from what you might know about Simon Peter, he came quick with an answer, well, Lord, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now that too is a contextually a powerful answer. You are the Messiah. That's the Hebrew word for the anointed one. Jesus, the Messiah. But we also use another word to say the same thing, but in the Greek context and in a Roman world, Jesus is also the Christ. Same word, context here. Again, back to political reality. Did you know that the Caesars, the emperors of Rome, described themselves with that word, Christ? Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus is delighted, right, with Peter's answer. Peter, you got it right. He's so excited. He can hardly control himself, it seems. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. You got it right for once, right? Because we've kind of come to realize that, that Peter usually gets stuff wrong. But then not to let Peter get too big of a head, even in being right. And he said, you know, but Peter, flesh and blood didn't do this for you. You didn't think of this on your own. In fact, no, it came to you from the gift of the Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit speaks to us. The Spirit moves us forward to say such things. But then Jesus gives him some pretty good marks. He says, hey, you are Peter, and on this rock, again, context, it was a play on words because Petros, or Peter, is the word rock. So it's the same rock, and when this time at least Peter's not a rock head. <laughs> I will build my church on this, and the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. Powerful, powerful moment. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Among other things, I hear the power of forgiveness. It's one of the reasons that I introduced the book by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He was part of an incredible process, an architecture of forgiveness that happened in South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was the chairperson of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or as it's known, the TRC, which was created by the Nelson Mandela government to bring national unity when they came to the end of the evil racial system of apartheid. And that system, that TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was set up to go back and look into the violations that took place from 1960 to 1994 to provide support and reparation for the victims and their families and to bring a full report of what effect apartheid had had on South African society. Now, it was a pretty amazing moment because what happened in so many cases is they brought victims and they brought the the persons that, that brought these heinous crimes against the victims, they brought perpetrators and victims into the same room, they sat them down, the stories were told, the violations were named, and then the victim was asked to forgive. Wait, for, forgive? How, how, how could that be? But Nelson Mandela knew, as does Archbishop Desmond Tutu, that Forgiveness is a powerful thing, and he says this about, Tutu says this about forgiveness. When I talk of it, I mean the belief that you can come out on the other side a better person. A better person than the one being consumed by the anger and the hatred. Because remaining in that state locks you into the state of being a victim. Victimhood. Making you almost dependent then on the perpetrator. 
But if you are called to forgive, if you can find a place to forgive, you're no longer chained to that perpetrator. And not only that, you might be able to help the perpetrator. That was one of the, the great gifts of the truth and reconciliation process overseen by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Let's keep going by going back to the all-important question today. Well, I'm not going to give you my answer because I'm working on it all the time, always trying to understand a better answer, but I want to say this. So often, my answer almost always begins in the particular. I think about what Christ has done for me, overpowered the place of death and life, given new life to me, promised a new creation, a resurrection, to be together with all of God's people, with family and friend, and but most important, to the very presence of Christ himself in this new heaven and new earth. That's amazing. That's for me. But then at that very moment, as soon as I've said that, then I realize that I'm called also to recognize that Christ is the universal Christ for all time and for all of creation. Let's just say for all of the universe and beyond, if there is such a thing. So I think every person has that opportunity to know that this Christ is in the particular for them, but also calls them to live in the universal reality of that love for all. So living the answer is maybe one of the best ways of answering it. And one of the gifts that we pastors have is that we see oftentimes from day to day how people live and answer that question, but who do you say that I am? It's been a busy week this week of caring for members, funerals, new health concerns. And so today, just a couple of those that I think bring the answer. The first happened in the funeral of one of our members. She was 101 years old. One of my first memories of her took place just a couple years ago now that uh, we went to sing Christmas carols to her house and this 100-year-old, about 100-year-old woman immediately connected to one of our three-year-olds. And a bond was made there that was only, obviously, Christ, singing of Christ's birth. This lady was special. Her caretaker says that she would not talk negative about others. She didn't complain. And she went on to explain that every night, as the caretaker left her room as she readied for sleep, she could hear this childlike prayer, this conversation of sorts, that went on something like, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, and, I, and, I, and I really miss my husband. I, I really like to go. To live as Christ, to die as gain, Paul says. You see... For me, her life, all 101 years, is the answer to the question. But who do you say that I am? Death came near to another family in our congregation. To one of our members lost a younger brother. How challenging that must be. And yet that younger brother had cancer about a year and... Uh, and our member knew that it was better that he was no longer suffering. And such faith that is ready to let go for the sake of what Christ will do, that too is the answer to the question, but who do you say that I am? Also, a number of members have been facing health challenges this week. One of our members faces a very challenging, sudden diagnosis. And in that, yet, fear, of course. But yet, faith to say, uh, pa Pastor, I, I want those folks to pray for me in that prayer group, in the FELC prayer group. I need those prayers moving forward. And so we stopped right there. When we finished, uh, pray we prayed, praying for this person and their family. Praying for the reality of a medical team and giving them wisdom and insight to deal with this challenging situation. And see, see, dear friends in Christ, that is the answer coming from that member. That is the answer to the question, who do you say that I am? And the last answer for today actually came first. Just minutes after we'd finished last week's parking lot service, 
I wasn't expecting it. I have to admit, I'm not even sure I knew what the passage was for the next sermon. And a member came up to me and gave me then what I didn't realize was the answer, but is the answer. The member came up to me and said, yeah, I've been reading uh, Bonhoeffer this week, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. See, he's the kind of guy that if you, if you mention a book in a sermon, he goes out and buys it and reads it. No formal education, theology, ethics, or anything like that, but he just buys the books and reads them. And then comes back and wants to talk to me about them, and often he knows more about the books than I do. <sighs> so he announced that he was reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer's classic, The Cost of Discipleship. The storyline that says when Christ calls someone, a man, he bids them to come and die. And throughout the book, Bonhoeffer keeps asking, what is the cost of discipleship? What does that mean? If you don't know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor during World War II. He stood up against the Nazis and took part in an assassination plot to kill Hitler, and then he was executed for his place in that, just weeks before the war was over. And he is a true theologian of the cross who knows about the cost of discipleship. So there on the parking lot, not intending to, our member preached a sermon to his pastor in just a matter of a minute or two, answering the question, what is the cost of discipleship? Answering the question that I had not yet even thought about, who do you say that I am? The answer then given by our member puts it in such simple terms, it's so easy, and yet it would take a lifetime and beyond to live it out. His answer to what is the cost of discipleship is also the answer to who do you say that I am. The answer is that you, Lord Jesus, you, Lord Jesus Christ, you, Lord Jesus, the Messiah, are everything. Everything. Amen.